Okay. Um, I hope um, the last session was helpful. Um, let's just get our minds back into where we left off. Um, can anyone remember the two Hebrew letters, doesn't matter the pronunciation, that um, in the Book of Lamentations were swapped out of uh, alphabetical order? Iron and pay. Thank you very much. Okay. The three times in chapter two, um, those are the two letters. Um, the three times in, in chapter two, chapter three, and chapter four, um, the pay comes before the iron, the ayin, however you say it. Um, and I said at the time when we looked at this that God intended this for a person. It can't just be by chance. It can't just be that God forgot the alphabet and, and forgot what order it was in. It, 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 it wouldn't be that as the answer, would it? And perhaps you were thinking over the break, perhaps you weren't, um, but perhaps at the time you were thinking, well, what was the purpose? Why did God intend for these letters to be swapped over? Is there a purpose to it or is it just an interesting grammatical feature? And I wanted to just give you in the next couple of minutes an idea of uh, that I had with when Rachel and I were thinking about this of the lesson that God could be trying to teach us through this break in the alphabetical order. Okay. Now, what's really interesting, and like I said in the first session, I'm not a Hebrew scholar. Okay. So if anyone is, um, please come and correct me if I'm wrong. But from the research that I've done, Hebrew letters can also be seen as words. And I've tried to show this um, through this on the screen. So you can see the iron or the A in, um, is, is the letter or, or the picture for the I, okay? And you can see that come through um, in verse 16 of that one, my eyes weep, and you can see the Aleph letter uh, over across on the left there, okay? So just remember, if you, if you haven't quite understood that bit, A in, I, okay? The pay, as you can see underneath, um, is the symbol or the word of the pay is the mouth, Okay, so just remember if it, that you've got A in is pay, uh, A in is pay, A in is for I, and pay is for mouth. Now we know in Lamentations that at these letters in chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4, the alphabetical structure breaks down. We saw that, didn't we, in the previous session? Okay, but I'm going to ask a question now, don't worry if we don't know it. Does anyone know? A chapter in the Bible, it's not, you, you can call it a chapter, you'll see why I say that in a minute. Anyone know a chapter in the Bible where there is a perfect acrostic poem? Yes, thank you very much, well done. Psalm 119, let's go there in our Bibles, because in Psalm 119, I'm going to show you now, we have a perfect acrostic poem, like Lamentations chapter 1, where there is um, where there is no break, where we get that alphabet chart from Aleph to Tav. Okay. Um, <coughs> and what you'll notice in Psalm 119, there are 176 verses, and we had the word stanza used earlier. There are 22 stanzas, 22 sections in this psalm, okay? And each section, each stanza has the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So Aleph, Bet, and each stanza has eight verses. Again, if you do the maths, eight, stan uh, eight verses times 22 letters, 22 stanzas, you get 176, which is the amount of verses in the psalm. And within that psalm, you get these two Hebrew letters of Ayin and Pei. Let's just go there um, in our Bibles. Let's go to the first section in verse 121. And obviously, this is in the correct order. So the Ayin comes first. Unlike in Lamentations, chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4, where the pay comes first, okay? And what I want us to do, and this is the best way to, to understand Scripture. Some of you might be thinking, oh, these, these letters, this grammar stuff, like, you know, you probably go to a commentator or, or, or somebody who was, uh, you know, an expert in Hebrew to try and understand it. 
you can do that, but I would recommend the best way to try and understand scripture is look at other scripture to try and understand it. And here we have a perfect acrostic. And there's got to be a link here with Lamentations, hasn't there, with the acrostic pattern that we've looked at. So let's go to Psalm 119 and verse 121. And while you're just looking at Psalm 119, hopefully you've picked up at verse 1, you had Aleph. At verse 9, you had Bet. Verse... Um, Verse 25, you had Dalet. So you've got all these letters, okay? Hopefully you're just familiarising yourself with those. And just before we go, sorry, to verse 121, um, I always remember this psalm. It's my favourite psalm. And the reason it's my favourite psalm, it was it, the day I was baptised on the 9th of March, this was the reading, okay? My uncle spoke and he went straight to verse 9. And this is really applicable for us. Because the whole point of Psalm 119 is verse 9. The question that David asks in this psalm is, how can a young man, a young woman be pure? How, in, I think in the AV it says, how can they cleanse their ways? And this is how you do it. By guarding, by keeping the word of God in your life. And this psalm, if you go through it, I haven't got time to go through it now, but you will find loads of different words for God's word. Law, testimonies, word, commands. There's loads of different Hebrew words for God's word. And so I want you to keep that in mind when we look at what the A in means here. Because when you arrive at verse 121, this section on A in, look at what it says about what the I should be doing okay verse 121 you can follow on the screen or or in your bible i have done what is just and right do not leave me to my oppressors give your servant a pledge of good let not the insolent oppress me my and this is the part Verse 123, my eyes, my a in, that's what that word, that letter is there at the start, long for your salvation and for the fulfilment of your righteous promise. Deal with your servant according to your steadfast love. Remember that verse, we're going to come across steadfast love um, in Lamentations. And teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. It is time for the Lord to act, for your law has been broken. Therefore, I love your commandments above gold, above fine gold. Therefore, I consider all your precepts to be right. I hate every false way. So these eight verses, this section on, on A in, on what the I should be doing, teaches us that with our eyes, in this obviously metaphor sense, we should be longing with our eyes to see salvation we should be longing to see the kingdom come that's what our eyes should be doing and they should be upset when they when we see people in our lives breaking the commands of God and that's what the psalmist said here okay it's time for God to act in verse 126 because people have been breaking your law so that's what our eyes should be doing longing to see salvation and being upset when we see people breaking God's command well, let's see now what the pay section's about. What should the mouth be doing? Okay. Verse 129. <coughs> Your testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, my soul keeps them. The unfolding of your words give light. It imparts understanding to the simple. That's what God's word does. Look at what the mouth should be doing. Verse 133. I open my mouth... And pant because I long for your commandments. Turn to me, be gracious to me, as is your way with those who love your name. Keep steady my steps according to your promise and let no iniquity, no sin get dominion over me. Redeem me from man's oppression that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. Look what word occurs now in verse 136. My eyes, my a in, it goes back to the a in now, shed streams of tears. Why? Once again, because people do not keep your law. So this verse, this section on the mouth is teaching us that we've got to have mouths that are open. Again, I'm not saying you should be sitting there 
like this in chairs, like trying to take God's word. This is a metaphor, it's a picture, isn't it? We've got to be taking God's word into our lives. We've got to then live it. And this, as I said, this long psalm is all about taking God's word into our lives. So as verse 9 says, we can be clean and we can be right before him. Well, what we now need to do, like I said earlier, is compare scripture with scripture. We're going to p- compare this perfect um, acrostic structure in psalm with the broken alphabetical structure where the A and the pain swap in Lamentations. Okay, so it's probably worth, if you can, keep a hand. I'm going to keep one Bible there with Psalm 119. You haven't got the privilege of that having two. Um, but keep a hand in Psalm 119 and just flick back in your Bibles to, to Lamentations um, chapter 1. <coughs> so, in chapter 1 of Lamentations, remember, we had a perfect acrostic. The A in and the pay are correct in this in this order. And in verse 16, where the A in should be, okay, where it isn't in the other chapters, this is what it says. For these things I weep. Mine eye, mine eye, my A in, my A in runs down with water. Because the comforter that should relieve my soul is far from me. My children are desolate because the enemy has prevailed so it's speaking here of the eye crying and you can imagine as we learned in that first session why there was crying going on because of the terrible things that were taking place in Jerusalem at that time under the Babylonian captivity now at the outset you might think well it seems very similar to Psalm 119 the crying is taking place because of the destruction but can anyone remember what the last verse of Psalm 119 said. Why should the eyes be weeping? Anyone remember? You can look back in the psalm if you want to. What was the spiritual reason as to why the eyes should be crying? Was it because of what the destruction that they saw? Thanks Dan, absolutely. Look at the screen. The eyes should have been crying because people... We're not, we're, we're not keeping the law of God, okay? And that wasn't the case here. In Lamentations, the people aren't crying because the law of God has, has been broken. They, they don't actually even realise at the time that their suffering was because of the sins that they had done. It's not following the spiritual pattern here. They're weeping because of the pity that they are going through. Now, in chapter 2... Chapter 2, remember, is where the first swap happens in the letters, okay? In verse 16. And obviously, pay arrives, which was the mouth. Look what it says in Lamentations 2, 16. All your enemies have opened their mouths against you. They hiss, they gnash their teeth, they say, we have swallowed up Jerusalem. Certainly, this is the day that we look for. This is the enemy speaking. We have found, we have seen it now here this is the first time that the pay the mouth comes before the a and in the broken acrostic of lamentations can anyone remember from psalm 119 what the mouth should have been doing spiritually panting longing for the word of god i open my mouth and i pant because i long for your commands and here in lamentations it's not even the mouth of jerusalem that's open it's not even jerusalem who's got their mouths open taking in god's word who is it it's babylon it's the enemy and what is their mouth doing it's open wide and it's waiting to metaphorically devour and eat and destroy jerusalem as we saw in jeremiah 52 it's all the wrong way round, isn't it This is why it's broken in Lamentations, because they're not following that spiritual pattern. They're not longing for God's word. They're not looking to turn to God. They're wallowing in the pity and the suffering that they're going through. And once again, here in chapter 3 on the screen, look at who it is that's opening their mouth. All our enemies, and again, it's verse 46, remember, it's the 3 verse 1 in chapter 3, where the 66 verses... 
And look what it says where the pay comes in at verse 46. All our enemies have opened their mouths against us. And because of this, my eye runs down with rivers of water. Is it going to say because they're not following God's word? No, it's because of the destruction of the daughter of my people. My eye trickles down and ceases not without any intermission. Till the Lord looks down and beholds from heaven. My eye affects my heart because of all the daughters of my city. Jerusalem responds to the enemy by weeping because of what take, has taken place. There is no longing for God's salvation. There is no mouth taking in the commandments of God in order to repent. And finally, in chapter 5, sorry, chapter 4, because remember chapter 5, there is no structure. In chapter 4, um, when the aim comes last again, instead of coming first, um, look at what happens. As for us, our eyes as yet failed for our empty help. In our watching, look at what they're watching for with their eyes. Is it God's salvation? No, they're watching for a nation that could save them. Their eyes are failing because there is no hope for Jerusalem. They're not looking, they're not seeking for God's salvation. They're waiting for a human, fleshly nation to save them. And you might be sitting here again thinking, what on earth are we learning from this breakdown in the alphabetical structure? Why are we looking at these verses where these letters swap over? Well, like I said, I don't think any word is wasted in the Bible. And to me, the, le the lesson is there for us. Israel should have been sad over the city. They should have been sad for what's happened. We are sad when we see destruction and chaos and disorder in the world that we live in. But they should be sad because people aren't turning to God, because people aren't following his commands. Yet instead, they've allowed a human nation to destroy them. And with their eyes, they're not looking for God. They're looking for a human nation to save them. And the lessons are there for us. When we find ourselves in these moments of suffering like Israel did, who are we looking to with our eyes? We do self-pity ourselves. We do cry and be upset in these moments of, of turmoil that we're going through. But who is it that we're looking for? Are we just wallowing in our self-pity? Or are we looking to human things to try and encourage us? You know, strategies that we find from the world. Or are we turning to God, to his word? The only thing, as we're going to discover from this weekend, that can truly give a lasting hope and this to me is, is the real turning point this morning in our sessions where we now hopefully really start to get to the practical part of our lives where we really start to think about those questions of why does God allow suffering what is the point of suffering why does God allow it to happen why doesn't he just allow it to not happen and we'd all have great lives and hopefully serve him in a good way and this is the answer that I want us to to start thinking about. In our lives, just like Israel in the time of Lamentations, we all suffer. All of us in this room have suffered, as we saw last night, in very, very different ways. We've suffered at different levels of intensity. And when we suffer, you might think of another one now, but I could think of three ways that we can respond to suffering in our life. The first way is we just accept it. It's a part of life. It happens by chance, by probability, and we just have to get on with it, even though it's hard. And lots of people around us, that, that's how they'll cope with it. We just got to get on with it. It's life. Okay. The second way is we can become perhaps not as positive and we can be very angry. Uh, and and, and our, our suffering can manifest itself in many, many different ways. And we look to blame somebody. We might even blame ourselves. Okay, that can happen as well. We can be more specific about that. If we have a faith, um, or we're of a faith, um, we can actually look to blame God in the situation and, and cast the blame on him and say, well, this book, this God that I worship, he's caused this. And we see that in Job's wife. Uh, we'll, we'll reference that in, in a little bit further. But obviously the question that I, the, the response I'd really like us to consider this weekend is this third one, that we accept in our lives that God allows us to suffer and ultimately, because God is allowing us to suffer, scripture teaches us that there is a reason. There is 
a purpose. And the question every single one of you need to ask yourself and answer really by the end of this weekend is what will be your answer? What will be your response to when you suffer in your life? Because this isn't a question that you can just put off, is it? Because suffering is unfortunately a huge part of all of our lives. And obviously, I, I, I want this weekend to try and, I'm not going to answer all your questions, but I want it to begin answering that question. And God willing, show that with God, there is a purpose, there is a reason. Because really, when you think about the first two options, there isn't any hope to these first two options, is there? There will be suffering in the first one, so you better just get on with it. There's nothing to look forward to, there's no reason to it, it's just chance. The second option, it gives you a release, it gives you a bit of a punch bag to, to release some of the blame onto somebody, that maybe gets rid of a bit, a bit of the anger, but it doesn't give you a purpose and it might not even give you an answer, even if you have got someone to blame. Whereas option three, the option obviously that we're going to think about, does give us a reason to our suffering and more importantly, it gives us a hope. Now I said earlier that if we read the book of Lamentations as a whole, um, and we read it in this linear order of chapter 1, then chapter 2, then chapter 3, then chapter 4, and then chapter 5, then you'd probably get a picture like this of Lamentations, all right? Because you'd start off at a very low point, as we saw in chapter 1. You then start to maybe get a bit of that release in chapter 2. You've started to blame God. You've maybe started to accept, oh, God is this superior being. I've got to take a bit of responsibility. And then as we're going to see in a moment, you get to chapter 3 and you're on this spiritual high. You really start to understand and see this is why suffering happens in life. This is, this is, I can, this is tangible. This is something I can do something with. And you're at the top of the roller coaster and everything's good. But then if you carried on reading the book, you then start to dip and realise, actually, it was because of the people that led me that made me suffer. It's because of this and that that made me suffer. And as we saw in the acrostic structure, you get to chapter five and everything's a mess again. Everything's jumbled and disordered and there is no structure or order to our suffering. Well, what I want to do now is um, I just want to have a look at the chapters in a little bit more detail. Because if we just turn to chapter one, chapter one is very much a description of how bad the, the, the captivity of Babylon is. And there is no one to give comfort. Let's just read the opening three verses of Lamentations one. I do keep flicking from versions. I'm going to read from the AV now. I apologise, I made notes in different Bibles, which is not helpful. So I've had to bring three Bibles to try and be able to get my... <laughs> My thoughts across. But there we go. Verse 1 of Lamentations 1. How does the city sit solitary, alone, that was once full of people? This is the observation that Jeremiah is getting when he's witnessing what he's seeing. How has she become as a widow? The picture there of a widow being alone, like Jerusalem. She was a great among the nations and princesses among the provinces. She was high and lofty. How? Has she become a tributary or like an offshoot from the main source? Verse 2, she weeps sore, bitterly in the night. Her tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has no one to comfort her. All those nations that once gave her things, they don't want to know her now that she has nothing. All her friends have dealt treacherously, evilly with her. They have become her enemies now. They're no longer friends. Judah has gone into captivity because of affliction and because of great servitude. She dwells among the heathen and she finds no rest. So Jerusalem here is all alone. She has no one to comfort her and she's lost. And if we just flick over to verse 12 of Lamentations chapter 1, we see again how Jerusalem felt. We see them asking a question. Look what it says in verse 12. This is Jerusalem as a nation speaking. Is it nothing to you, all you people that pass by? You behold and see our sorrow, which has been done unto us, wherewith the Lord has afflicted us. We can see the blame there in the day of his fierce anger. Jerusalem is looking at the nations that are going past them and questioning the observer and saying, how can you walk past this? 
The, the mothers eating their children and the children going hungry and the people that look like sticks. How can you just walk past this and not take any pity on us? You're, making, you're walking past and you're making those reports and nothing seems to matter to you. And you can see why Jerusalem is so bitter against the people and the nations around them. All the suffering that they're going through, the evil that was going on, and there is nobody to comfort her. And we can feel like that in our suffering. We look around and we perhaps flick through Facebook or Instagram or look on Snapchat and we see how great people's lives are. And we, we're, we're sitting in our life thinking, I haven't got that. I feel lost. I feel like all these terrible things are happening. Why is it going well in their life and they're not helping me or encouraging me? We can feel just like Jerusalem did. And the sad reality is, as I've learned in the sort of my uh, sort of last 20 years of life, is that at times, just like the nations around Israel, people won't care. People who were once friends won't comfort you. But as we're going to learn, there is a God that does listen. There is a God who does comfort. And he's the one that we can turn to as we're going to learn here. And what we start to realise, unfortunately, it's a really sort of powerful message, but also a, a sad one as we think about the state of the world, that a life, a world without God, when we start to look at the things that go on now and in the time of lamentations, is bleak. It's empty. There's, there's no hope, really. There's lots of glamour and glitz and lights, but there's no hope to it. And yet when you arrive at chapter 2, look at what Israel now starts to do. When they realise the nations aren't listening, they turn and blame somebody else. They start to blame God. And if you've got a crayon now, it's well worth doing this. I did it in my Bible. Look at the amount of times they blame God. Verse 1, how has the Lord covered us? Verse 2, the Lord has swallowed up the inhabitants of Jacob. The next line in verse 2, he, God, has thrown us down in his anger. Again in verse 2, he has brought us down to the ground. And the final line in verse 2, he has polluted the kingdom. Verse 3, he has cut us off in his anger. Verse 3 again, he has drawn back his right hand, his, his hand of salvation from the enemy. Again in verse 3, he has burned Israel like a flaming fire. Verse 4, he has bent his bow like an enemy. Verse 5, the Lord has become our enemy and swallowed us up. Verse 5, he has swallowed up all his palaces. Verse 5 again, he has increased the daughter of Judah again, um, of Judah, lamenting. Verse 6, God has violently taken away his dwelling place. Verse 6 again, he has destroyed his palaces. The Lord has caused the feast to, to cease. Verse 7, the Lord has cast off his altar and abhorred his dwelling place. He has given us into the hand of the enemy. And finally, we won't keep going, but I could keep going. Verse 9, the Lord has... Sorry, verse 8, the Lord has purpose to destroy the wall of the daughter of Zion. We can see Israel here really blaming God, really saying, this is your fault, God, that this has happened. You've done these things to us. And it perhaps goes back to that second response of looking to blame somebody. But ultimately, this isn't an answer. This doesn't give us a reason or a purpose. This is just a punch bag to just release some of the emotion that we've got instead of actually deal, de dealing with it. And we'll leave chapter three a second because that's where we're going to go at the centre. Because that's how you should really, I think, read the book of Lamentations. You might have heard of the phrase of chiasm before. If you ever listened to Uncle Stephen Palmer, um, he always talks about chiasms. And it's this idea of how a he it's another Hebrew structure of how you should read the Bible a little bit like this. And there's a centre point. So sort of chapter one, chapter five, chapter two, chapter four, and then chapter three in the middle and that's what Lamentations is a bit like it's almost like this package inside the middle and I'll show you a picture of how I think it's packaged in a moment but we'll deal with chapter three where the light is in the middle but chapter four if you just go there follows a similar pattern to chapter one and two um, because if you've noticed some of you might have noticed this but chapter one chapter two and chapter four all begin their chapters with this very simple word how Okay, how is the city sitting on its own? How has the Lord covered the daughter of Zion? How has the gold in the city become dim? How has the most pure gold changed? 
And again, this, the way this word how is used is to not try and see purpose. It's not even asking a question. There's no question marks on that screen. Instead, it's, it's used as an exclamation. It's used to exclaim how desperate the situation in Jerusalem is. It's not seeking to see purpose. It's not seeking to even turn to God. It's just them saying, look how bad it is for us. Look at it. It's terrible. This is what's going on. And as we already know, chapter 5 is just a mess of structure. Um, The final verse shows how uh, the people felt rejected by God because of his anger against their sin. And so the book of Lamentations, I think, if you want to have a picture for what the book of Lamentations look like, it looks like this picture on the screen. Just take that in a second. It looks like it's in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 4, chapter 5, surrounded in darkness, surrounded in suffering. And yet in the very centre of the book, there is light in chapter 3. And as I said, the centre of this glowy, of this depressing book has a glow, a purpose, a reason as to why we suffer. And so hopefully now for the rest of the weekend, I want us to really allow the book of Lamentations to speak to us. This session is called Listening to Lamentations. And that's what we're going to do now. Let it show us the meaning and answers to us living in a world of suffering, of anxiety, of uncertainty and sadness. So let's now go to that centre. Let's go to chapter three and let's reveal this meaning to suffering and this purpose to suffering from God. And if you don't mind, I know we've read quite big chunky sections of scripture today, but I hope it's been helpful to get context to what we're reading. And I always think that's vital with Bible study. As I'm reading it, though, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the first 18 verses of Lamentations 3. But every time I've read a verse, I'm going to flick up a summary. So if you haven't quite grasped what, it, what, what the verse was saying, there'll be a little line on the board and it will paint for us a picture again of what chapter 3 is all about. OK, let's just go there. Chapter 3. And um, let's just go in at, at verse um, 1. <coughs> Okay, Lamentations 3 and verse 1. I am the man that has seen affliction by the rod of God's anger. He has led me and brought me into darkness, not into light. Surely against me is he turned. He turns his hand against me all day. My flesh and my skin he has made old. He has broken my bones. He has built against me and compassed me with gall and travail. He has set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. He has hedged me, fenced me in. I can't get out. He's made my chain heavy. You can see this very poetic language of of what this man who's seen affliction is going through. Also, when I cry and shout, he shuts out my prayer. He has enclosed my ways with stone. He has made my paths crooked. He was unto me as a bear lying in wait. And as a lion in secret places, he's turned aside my ways and he's pulled me in pieces. He's made me desolate. He has bent his bow and set me as a mark for the arrow. He has caused the arrows of his quiver to enter into my reins. And I think that's the better translation of that is his kidneys, almost like his inward parts. I was a derision to all my people, and I was their song all the day. He's filled me with bitterness. He's made me drunk with wormwood, with bitterness. He has also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He has covered me with ashes. And thou has removed my soul from peace. I forgot 
prosperity. I forgot what it was like to have good things go well in my life. And verse 18, I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Can you relate to any of these feelings on the screen? Feeling like you're being led into dark places. Feeling like you're a target for people's comments or abuse. Feeling like people are building against you. Feeling like your soul, the things inside of you, you've got no peace in your life anymore. Feeling like you're drunk, not in a physical sense, but you're just full of bitterness and envy and all those nasty emotions. Feeling like arrows of nasty things being said have, have penetrated inside of you. Feeling like your teeth are, are sort of on edge or broken, that metaphor of like, you're just feeling not quite right with people. Feeling like people are lying in wait for you like a bear or a predator ready to attack. Feel like you've been pulled in pieces because of the suffering that you're going through. Feeling like you're being hedged about or your chain, your burden in life is just too heavy. And finally, after all of this, like that one in bold in the top right, just feeling like your hope in God has perished, has disappeared. See, in chapter 3, this man, who possibly was Jeremiah or, or somebody else, he had seen suffering. He really was suffering. And these descriptions in chapter 3 that we can see on the screen show that. And you again are possibly sitting here through the start of this weekend thinking to yourself, I'm sure Jordan just made a massive speech that, that this part, this chapter, you know, was all about hope. Uh, and, and if we stopped here at verse 18 in chapter 3, there would be no hope, would there? The man who had seen affliction would have no answers to his suffering. He would have no comfort to the things that he's gone through. And yet... This is where we turn in, a, in the book. This is where there's like a, a, a flick switched. Because what does this man do? Where and how does this man find hope? Look what it says in verse 20, verse, verse 19. He remembers his affliction. He remembers his misery. He remembers the wormwood and the gall, the suffering that he's gone through. His soul has them in remembrance and he's humbled by them. From the sufferings that he's got, He's brought low. And this is the turning point. This is what he does. This is the highlight point of Lamentations. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. This is the centre. This is the turning point of this very, very bleak and depressing book. He recalls something to mind. And when you recall something, you have to look back. And I have to be honest, when I think of looking back in the Bible, I think of people like Lot's wife. That's not a very good example, is it, of looking back? And we might ask the question, why, when we're suffering, do we need to look back? Why have we got to go back and look at things? Well, as we've seen up to this part in the book... When suffering is taking place in our lives, as chapter 5 showed us, suffering in the moment, if you've ever been there, it doesn't make sense. It's not tangible. It's not something you can hold. It's not something you can understand or relate to. And I'm going to be honest with you now. I'm going to give you a personal example of where in my life, I've not been through major trauma, but there's one highlight moment in my life where I really felt like this. You've all seen my son running around today. In July 2021, he was born and uh, we were obviously very joyful and happy and we praise God for that. And the first two weeks were, were lovely. We, had, we, we were looking after him. It all seemed to be going really well. And we noticed there'd been a bit of fall in his health. He wasn't feeding very well. He would got very, very high temperatures and we were a bit long. Better take him to the doctors as you do. Not really thinking too much of it. And uh, when we got to the doctors, she just said, he has got a temperature over 38. You've got to get him to hospital now. So that, that, this alarmed us and we thought, oh, we better get going. So it was a Friday evening and uh, we bombed to the hospital and got there. And unfortunately, it was times of COVID, so uh, I, I couldn't go in. So I sat in the car sort of waiting for H and Josiah. And basically, just to cut a long story short, what they discovered is he had sepsis. And if you know what sepsis is, it's a, it's a blood infection. 
And if you don't catch it in the vital hour, it's game over, really. And so you can imagine how Rachel and I were feeling at this moment that we'd had so much joy. We were at the top of the Groner Coaster in, in Lamentation's perspective. And now we were told by doctors, you need to start preparing yourself. You've got a two-week-old child and there's a slim chance of him sort of pulling through this. And so we felt rock bottom. We couldn't understand in that moment. There was no tangible reason as to why God had allowed this to happen. We tried in our life to, to please God. We tried to do what God had asked. And yet here before us, we were faced with a crisis. And this really made us evaluate, well, where do we put our hope? Where do we put our trust? Because if we went back to our reasons for suffering, if we went for reason number one, sadness. Reason number two, blame. Is that really going to give us any comfort? And we tried reason number three. And that idea of looking back to what God has done in the past was a massive motivation. Going back to God's word, looking at how God had dealt kindly with his people before, gave us hope, gave us reassurance to see that with God, all things Jesus teaches us are possible. And we had to believe in that. That was our only comfort. That was our only hope. And as you can see, for us, it, it was a, a thanks at the end of it, you know, and that might not be the case for all of us. And I, like I said yesterday, I do not um, know where you've come from in your life, the suffering that you have been through. But all I can say from that personal reflection in my life is having God, having God's word, having brothers and sisters uh, around the country in our own ecclesia supporting us, praying for us, you know, reading scripture to us. I always remember he had to go for a lumbar puncture, which is basically like an injection in your spine and that to get fluid off his spine. And uh, I remember we couldn't go into it. They said it's going to be too traumatic. And you might know some of you, uh, I won't say his name actually, but a brother at our ecclesia, um, he texts me as Josiah was about to go into this. And he said to me, this is a lovely parable of what God had to do. God had to give his son over. But God had to give his son over to enemies that were going to rip his body to part and put him on a cross. And yet I was giving my son over to doctors who we, we prayed would help him. Um, and for me, when you've got people like that, when you've got a community around you that are trying to support you, and maybe you've experienced this in your life, who are trying to encourage you and help you to see hope and reason in your suffering, it can give you so much comfort. And, and what we really learned from that, even though it was terrible, I don't, I, I'm glad it happened, and that might sound like a strange thing, but in two, year, two years on, with reflection and thought behind that, God was teaching me something there, and what that, that crisis moment helped us to do was to draw closer to God. I've never, ever prayed so hard in my life. You know, when I look at examples of prayer, I've never before sort of cried emotionally in prayer before. And, and what we have to learn in these moments of crisis is they allow things like that to happen. It draws us closer to God. It builds our character. It allows us to see a greater meaning. The past. The idea of looking back is the only thing that we have that is real. The only thing we have that we can relate to. And we might ask, well, what was it? You've, I've just given my reflection, but what was it that this man of affliction recalled to mind? What was it that gave him hope? What was it that he looked back to? Well, let's read it. Verse 22. I'll read verse 21 again because it's a beautiful verse. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that a man and woman should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. The man who had seen affliction was remembering back to all the good things that God had done in the past. The future hadn't happened, okay? The man who had saw affliction 
Even though he knew the prophecies, he didn't know what lay in store for Jerusalem. We at the time didn't know what in lay in store for Josiah. You in your moments of suffering don't know what the future is going to bring. We can't predict how our suffering is going to pan out. All we can do in those moments of crisis is look back to how God acted in the past. And this section is, I think, a real turning point in in overcoming suffering not overcoming it but dealing with it remembering the character of our God understanding the character of God is the real key because what we have to remember is God's character doesn't change it's a fact it's a solid thing unlike our situations that change from minute to minute day to day our challenges change our lives change our situations change God's character doesn't. And when we forget what is good, when we lose perspective in our moments of crisis and we start to just focus on ourselves, as most of the book of Lamentations does, as we saw, the people kept saying, how has this happened? How has this happened? When it's all about me, when it's all about us, what starts to happen is emotions start to come out in different ways. Anger, frustration, doubt, sadness, blame. And they all present themselves in a whole host of different ways. Or you can be like that hedgehog that just goes in the corner in their room and and, and just can't deal with it anymore. And that's the sad reality of how suffering can affect each one of us. But when we find ourselves feeling like this, we need to remember God's good character. And if we do, if we can try and see it through the eye of faith, it does start to put things into perspective. God's character can change how we think about suffering. And these are some of the characters that cropped up. Righteousness, faithfulness, something that's dependable, steadfast love. And that's a beautiful Hebrew word. In the Hebrew, it's hesed or kesed. And it's a love that that is constant. It's sure. Mercy. Something we don't deserve. Goodness. When we recall to mind the character of our God, as verse 29 says of Lamentations chapter 3, Our mouth is shut. Why is our mouth shut when we remember God? Well, it links back to the acrostics in Psalm 119. Because when we think about God and the the beauty and the glory and the honour that we should give him, it silences us. It humbles us. It reminds us of our fleshly position in his sight. He is our maker. He's the potter. He created us. You know, who are we to question what, what plan and purpose he has for us? It's only God's mercies that we are not destroyed. It's only because of his goodness that as human beings, we all sin, Romans teaches us. We all fall short of the glory of God. It's because of his goodness in Jesus that we, don't, that we, that we can have a hope. Well, let's just look at what it says in verse 31 of Lamentations 3, just to sort of start to bring this, this message to a conclusion. Verse 31. For the Lord will not cast off forever. But though he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he does not afflict willingly nor grieve the children of men to crush under his feet all the prisoners of the earth, to turn aside the right of a man before the face of the Most High, to subvert a man in his cause, the Lord approves not. Who is he that says... And it comes to pass when the Lord commanded it not. Out of the mouth of the Most High proceeds not evil and good. And this is the real key to accepting suffering from God. That actually we deserve to suffer because we're humans. We do sin. From the world's perspective, they they don't get it, do they? Because from, from a worldly perspective, when we look at sin, or when we look at suffering, if we have a faith, well, it's God who's giving us that. But when we see it from a godly spiritual perspective, we realise that we are sinful. We realise that we're in need of God. It's only God's goodness that does that. And I think a really helpful passage in the New Testament to, to explain this is Ephesians 2. Just turn there with me to Ephesians 2, because this beautifully underpins God's compassion, God's grace and God's goodness in Jesus. If you ever need reminding that you know, sometimes I think this passage, if you're feeling a bit proud, it's a good passage to go to, okay? Because it reminds you that it's only God that can save. If you're feeling like you're unworthy 
and you can't do anything that's good enough for God, go to this passage because it reminds you that it's only God that can save. Look what it says in verse 1. You were dead in your sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our own flesh, carrying out the desires of what we want to do in our body and our minds. And we were by nature children of anger, like the rest of mankind. Before we knew God, before we knew Jesus, and that can mean baptism, but I also think that's, we all in here know God, we all know Jesus. When we're enlightened by God and his word, we can turn to this new way of living where we don't have to be like the sons of men. Look what it says in verse four. God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, He's made us alive together with Christ. This is the first time it's mentioned. By grace, you've been saved. You've been raised up with Jesus and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the time to come in the kingdom, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. You've seen all the language here from Lamentations, aren't we? And it's repeated again. By grace you've been saved. Through what? Through doing stuff? No. Through belief. Through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. It's not a result of works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship. We've been created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We have been given an amazing hope in Jesus that we can have life in the kingdom to come. That's what gives us perspective. That's what gives us hope. And it's not by climbing Mount Everest or or being the most righteous person. Or I've heard the phrase before, I said it at a study group the other week, getting kingdom points of good works that we do. It's not about that, okay? It's not about that. What it's about is by living in faith, by believing that it's only God can, that can save us. And that should drive our works by the belief that we have. Because actually, this message is a consistent message right from the beginning. When God made the earth and when Adam and Eve brought sin into the world and sin brought suffering, God made a promise. And he said, I will put enmity, division between you, the serpent, and the woman. Between the seed of the serpent, the seed of human nature, and the seed of hers, which is the spiritual seed. It shall bruise the serpent's head, and you shall bruise his heel. And what this verse teaches us, that it's only through Christ that human flesh can be saved, through the seed of the woman. We are all sinful. It's through God's goodness that we're not destroyed, that we're not without hope. And when we can accept this, and that's a massive thing to accept, by the way. The things I'm saying aren't just easy throwaway comments. Accepting that is hard. Accepting you're wrong in a world that tells you you're right and you deserve things is a hard thing to accept. Believe me, I have to sort of talk about it to children at work. I'm a teacher. I have to talk about this to to, to kids that they have a right and, and all this sort of stuff. And yet what the Bible teaches us is we are in submission to God. He is our creator. And when we can accept this very hard reality, we can start to overcome this issue of feeling like we're owed something like Israel did in Lamentations. God has given Jesus as our hope. And suffering is God's opportunity to show mercy, to reveal himself. The suffering, I promise, it's not forever. It might even go in this life. It will come to an end. And if it doesn't in this life, it will in the kingdom. And we see in Lamentations, just go back there in your Bibles in chapter 3. I promise I'm finishing now. You go back to Lamentations chapter 3. We see this absolutely beautiful centre of the book. And we see this five-step progression of hope. Okay, because in verse 18, as we've seen throughout the book of Lamentations, hope seems to be dead. Hope seems to be like there's nothing there. But then in verse 21, when he recalls to mind the goodness of God, 
hope starts to glimmer as a possibility. It's, it's sort of in touching distance as he starts to recall it to mind. And then verse 23 starts to build on this because then hope is something that we can receive every day from God's goodness. Every single new day is a fresh gift from God that we can hope in. By the way, this is in your workbook, this five-step progression, in case people I can see trying to scribble it down. Um, it's a fresh gift that we're given every morning, and we should be thankful for that. And actually, when we start to realise that it's this fresh gift that we can take in every day, we start to realise that suffering is a good thing because it produces hope. And therefore, hope gives us a purpose to whatever we're going through. And finally, verse 29 of Lamentations teaches us that actually hope is all we have. Hope is the thing that we can look to in these terrible moments, that we have a hope that God reveals to us in his word. And so the final sort of message I want to leave us on this morning is suffering is essential for these three things. Suffering perfects our characters it builds our characters, it creates characters that are more pleasing to God, which if we're desiring to please him is a good thing. Suffering allows God to reveal himself. It did for this man, it did for me in my suffering, and I'm sure it will for you. It allows us to draw closer to God in our relationship with him in prayer and in reading his word. And hope allows us the opportunity to repent. And I want to leave you with this verse, the final verse um, in Lamentations chapter 3. This is what I want to encourage all of us to do. Let us search our lives and try our ways. Put them to the test. See if they are godly. And that's what suffering does. And when we've done this, let's turn again to God, the Lord. And let us together lift up our hearts with our hands unto God who is in the heavens.